So we'll be talking about uh, primarily entrapment. If there's time at the end, I'll throw in a couple nurse thief tumors because I didn't know where to put them, and this is really more an entrapment uh, talk. So here's an example of a sciatic nerve. And the point I want to make here is that when we're looking at peripheral nerves, the short axis is where we're going to focus. That's where you can actually identify the nerve with confidence. Because in long axis, the sciatic nerve will almost look like a tendon at times. So any of the nerves, we're looking short axis. That's how we see them. We can track them, and you can see them as a cable. When you have a larger nerve like this, they describe a honeycomb appearance, where you have hypoechoic nerve fascicles and the echogenic <coughs> connective tissue around the nerve fascicles. Now remember, because this is the upper extremity, but I'm just showing some introductory comments here, because the nerve has both hypoechoic and echogenic parts of it, remember the nerve fascicles are hypoechoic, connective tissue hyperechoic, the conspicuity of that nerve depends on what's around it. What I mean by that is that if you have muscle tissue around the nerve, the nerve will jump out as being an echogenic structure because you're seeing the echogenic components um, better. When the nerve then is surrounded by connective tissue, the hypoechoic parts will actually look more conspicuous. This is an example in the forearm. This is the same nerve, but you can see around the echogenic tendons and connective tissue, the hypoechoic aspect jumps out, where if you look in, in the forearm where there's muscle around it, the, the echogenic parts jump out. Either way, it looks like a honeycomb. That is, I guess, the point I'm making here. So entrapment syndrome, so what are we looking at pathologically? Well, looking at the rat model, but this can be applied to humans, uh, compression will first cause ischemia of the nerve. And the first thing they're going to see a pathology, explaining what we see on ultrasound, is edema. And that correlates with the severity of axonal injury. With mild compression, then, you start to get demyelination, and then severe compression, you get axonal damage. One point I want to make here is that there's no inflammation going on here. We often use the term neuritis because the nerve is painful. But what we're trying to do is reevaluate what we're calling all these things because we're now going with newer treatments and we're trying to figure out what are we treating. So it turns out all the things we've called itis, like tendonitis, it's actually more tendinosis or tendinopathy after you know, a week or so of an injury. Bursitis, we now know that most times when the bursa is distended, which is uncommon, it's actually not inflamed. They've shown in trochanteric pain syndrome that if the bursa is distended, if you take that bursa out, it is not inflamed and not the cause of pain. It's just a reactive fluid from the tendon problem. Well, the same thing holds true with neuritis. It's really, unless you have leprosy or some true inflammatory situation, it's really edema from ischemia and then axonal damage. So what are we looking for with ultrasound? Well, if you look at the nerves in short axis as they go through the extremities, the nerve trunk should stay the same size, relatively speaking, or get smaller as the nerve fascicles arborize and we get down to less and less fascicles. If you look at these nerves as they travel through the extremities, there are various sites where each nerve passes through an enclosed space, typically a fiber osseous canal. Those are the sites where the nerve can be entrapped. So what we're looking for is edema, again, the first problem we see with entrapment. So when you're scanning the nerve in short axis, as the nerve is approaching this enclosed space, it will start to get hypoechoic and enlarged. And then as it goes into the space, it will get compressed. So that's the finding of entrapment anywhere in the body by MR or by ultrasound, is edema and enlargement of the nerve at and proximal to the entrapment site. A side point I want to make is that the amount of swelling of the nerve depends on how small the fiber osseous canal is. What I mean by that is if you look, let's say, at the cubital tunnel, that's a very small space. So that's why that nerve gets dramatically enlarged as it then compressed into the canal. Probably the next nerve that I see that's really enlarged can be uh, the median nerve. On the other end of the spectrum, talking about lower extremity, is the tibial nerve. People with uh, entrapment in the tarsal tunnel, I've never seen enlargement of the nerve in spite of electrodiagnostic tests showing abnormality. And the reason is that fibrous canal is humongous. You know, it contains, it's the tarsal tunnel. It has all the flexor tendons, the FHL. Because that space is so big, we don't have that axonal damming of edema that we see with the cubital tunnel. But nonetheless, what we're looking for is edema enlargement of, of, the, uh, of the affected nerve. 
One thing that's important is when we're looking at any nerve problem, denervation or not, we have to consider the end organ. And the earliest sign would be uh, edema of the muscle from denervation. So edema in muscle appears echogenic. Because what happens is you have more interfaces with muscle and this edema creating reflective echoes. Now one pitfall here is when you're looking at atrophy, at first glance you're going to say this image is too bright. I'm going to turn down the gain. And you can easily downplay the edema by setting the gain incorrectly. So what I do is when I'm looking for muscle problems in the setting of a nerve injury or entrapment, I look at the contralateral muscle, set the gain appropriately so that you can actually see muscle and fibroadipose layers, and then go to the symptomatic side and to see if it's echogenic. Now, if it's echogenic and small, then we use the term atrophy. If it's just echogenic, then it's probably just denervation and edema. So we're going to talk about three nerves here in the time of this talk here, starting at the knee and going down distally. I can look at some other nerves when during the, uh, the live demo, and of course in the workshops we can do the same. So starting at the knee, let's look at the common peroneal nerve. This, as you know, is formed from the sciatic nerve as it divides into the common peroneal and the tibial nerves. Uh, this nerve follows the posterior aspect of the biceps femoris. It then wraps around the fibular neck where it's prone to injury. It goes underneath the peroneus longus muscle, and then it divides into superficial and deep branches. It also gives off a lateral uh, serocutaneous nerve and three articular branches to the knee joints. And that's important in just a moment. I'll talk about that. So here on this Netter diagram, here is the biceps femoris that's been cut, showing how the common peroneal nerve parallels and goes posterior to the biceps femoris. Note here when it goes around the fibular neck, how it goes underneath the peroneus longus, a potential entrapment site. So there are a number of issues that occur here. One could be entrapment of the nerve here. One could be a laceration related to a fibular fracture or contusion for direct injury or what's termed intraneural ganglion cyst. So those are the most common things I see the common peroneal nerve about the knee. So here we can see the normal nerve. Now, why I stress the short axis as being most important, look at this in long axis. It looks like a fascial plane. It almost looks like a tendon, but that's the normal nerve. But in short axis, you see more of a honeycomb appearance. Note that's directly posterior to the biceps femoris. Okay, so here's a case of entrapment. This was a patient who was a golfer who started developing foot drop. And what we see here is the nerve, as it goes underneath this peroneus longus, you can see the nerve getting larger. So it's getting larger and larger in edematous as it goes through this enclosed space. Whenever you see the nerve that's enlarged, another indirect finding is if you push on the nerve with the transducer, it elicits symptoms. That nerve is very irritated. That's another feature to support the fact that this is abnormal other than the edema and enlargement. Here's a case who a patient was developing uh, symptoms, and although the nerve doesn't look abnormal, we see an exostosis here. This is a patient with multiple hereditary exostosis. And why I'm showing this is the benefit of still looking at radiography. Whenever you see some unusual bone contours, I mean, this could be a fracture, it could be benign or malignant tumor, I mean, the list goes on and on. But the radiograph clearly shows what this bone excrescence is. So keep in mind the uh, importance of a radiograph, even when performing ultrasound. So when you're looking at the end organ for the common peroneal nerve, we're looking at the anterior compartment of the leg. And here's an example where we see increased echogenicity compared to the asymptomatic side. It doesn't look that abnormal until you compare to the other side. So as I just mentioned, that is very important. So one of the interesting pathologies we see with the common peroneal nerve is the intraneural ganglion cyst. These do occur sporadically in other nerves around the body, but by far this is the number one location. Patients will present with pain and foot drop possibly, and they may have a fluctuating palpable mass in the region of the common peroneal nerve. What is interesting is 18% of those with foot drop are due to this ganglion cyst. So when I talk to my neurologists and neurosurgeons about this, they were surprised because they usually treat this like, 
Well, usually it's habitual leg crossing in someone who doesn't have a lot of body fat, and they presume it's idiopathic, but this number's high enough where I believe, and which is what we do at our institution, they should really have it imaged because of this ganglion cyst. So what's interesting is when people have foot drop, they, they fall into two categories. One is the ones with no etiology, and that's the ones, again, who have trauma or just compression from crossing their legs. But what's interesting, in contrast to this group, the ones with ganglion cyst have a high BMI. So, so why is that important? Well, this really explains what happens to form these ganglion cysts. So the knee joint itself connects to the tibiofibular joint in about 20% of the population. And that's where the fluid comes from to fill that, in, that nerve sheath. It's been shown that if you inject gadolinium in the knee joint, you'll see this in the ganglion cyst. So what happens is that when a patient has a high BMI, they're more likely to have internal derangement of the knee, they're more likely to have high pressure fluid in the knee. And where does that fluid go? It can go into the tibia joint, and then it can go through the articular branch of that tibia joint to form a ganglion cyst. So the high BMI and the connection with all these structures is what causes that ganglion cyst. It can also involve the tibial nerve uncommonly, but you're looking for this J-shaped area of fluid. Now, like all ganglion cysts, which are multilocular, you'll see this multilocular cyst going along the common peroneal nerve. Here with MR correlation, it's really hard to see because it's so small. Here it is coming around. Here's the multilocular fluid uh, compressing the common peroneal nerve. So here's the common peroneal nerve. There's a ganglion cyst. So if I were reading an MRI and the history was pain, which a lot of them say that, I would have totally walked by this. It looks just like one of these veins. So the resolution of ultrasound is helpful, of course, the clinical uh, judgment of like foot drop, I would really key in on that common peroneal nerve. They can be uh, quite large. This one was over 15 centimeters. It went up into the sciatic nerve. Note the multilocular appearance. Now it's important when you see these common peroneal nerves, uh, ganglion cysts, not to mistake them for a tib-fib joint cyst. Those are very common. How do you make this distinction? Well, it, for it to be an intraneural ganglion cyst, it should track along the nerve where a tib tibiofibular joint cyst won't track along the nerve. Okay, let's move on to superficial peroneal nerve. So it's a branch of the common peroneal nerve supplying sensory to the dorsolateral foot and ankle. It does have some collateral branches to the peroneal nerves, but it, it's predominantly sensory. Now the key thing is, again, every nerve has a key place where they tend to have issues with entrapment. We talked about the common peroneal nerve around the fibula. Well, for the superficial peroneal nerve, it occurs where the nerve pierces the curl fascia. It's about nine centimeters proximal to the fibular tip. So if you look here in this cross-sectional image, what's going to happen is this superficial branch of the, of the peroneal nerve is going to come through this fascial plane and come out right here. And that's what they're showing. And this can be the entrapment site. And that helps us find it because if you find the peroneal compartment and the anterior compartment, it's going to pop out between those two compartments. And again, if you measure up nine centimeters from the fibula, this is where it comes out. It's, it's over a centimeter, so it's, it's pretty uh, uniform, that measurement. Of course, if you have someone wearing a ski boot, you can have a direct trauma. But where this nerve comes through, this is where the entrapment can be seen. So here's a patient who presented with ankle pain. I performed an ankle ultrasound, which I looked normal. And then I asked the patient, could they point where it hurts or explain the symptoms more? Uh, she described sensory issues of her foot and ankle laterally, and then pointed up here and said, I feel a bump here when I'm performing my ballet maneuver. So basically, I had her do the maneuver and see what happened dynamically. And what we saw here was a muscle hernia that happened to occur right where the superficial peroneal nerve comes out. And it was causing a traumatic neuroma um, in that area. So when you have a nerve or an artery or vein that pierces the fascia, that can be a weakening that can predispose to muscle hernia. So she had a muscle hernia, which caused the subsequent compression of the nerve and a neuroma. 
So the dynamic imaging showed the muscle hernia, the resolution, and the, the direct correlation with the clinical findings showed the problem with the nerve. Now as we move on to finish with the tibial nerve, I just want to mention the sural nerve. Uh, I only have one example of something abnormal, but this nerve is easy to see uh, because if you look halfway between the peroneal tendons and the Achilles tendon at the ankle, it's right in between the two in the middle of this fat pad right next to the lesser saphenous vein. So it's very easy to find it at that level and you can track up or down. And the only abnormality I have here, which is not an entrapment, but I just wanted to show some other nerve things. This person had a head transection of this. And when you have a, a cut nerve, they tend to retract and then you'll form a neuroma. Neuroma is a normal response of the nerve trying to regenerate, and that's why it looks hypochalk and enlarged at the ends of the terminal stumps of that severed nerve. Okay, we're gonna go to the tibial nerve, and then finally at Morton neuroma. So the tibial nerve goes into the tarsal tunnel and it bifurcates predominantly into medial lateral plantar branches, which divide into interdigital nerves, and again, this has motor branches to the sole of the foot and sensory uh, as well, more distally. Now there are two other smaller nerves that come off of these nerves. You have the medial calcaneal branch and the inferior calcaneal branch. Some people have termed this Baxter's nerve. There's tremendous variability when where these nerves come off, as you can see here. Most commonly the medi medial calcaneal nerve comes off the tibial nerve, but it can come off with the medial lateral plantar branches as well and the inferior calcaneal branch usually comes off from the latter, lateral plantar nerve, so there's variability here. Here from the anatomic literature, you can see the tibial nerve coming down into the medial and the lateral plantar branches. Here's that median calcaneal nerve coming off, in this case, off the tibial nerve. And here's Baxter's nerve, or the inferior calcaneal nerve, coming off the lateral plantar nerve. So the inferior calcaneal nerve, I find extremely difficult to see. And I keep looking, and I'm not getting better, but I keep trying. Here's a paper, uh, Jay Smith's uh, group, uh, Mayo Clinic, showed in this cadaver, basically, that this is the first branch off the lateral plantar nerve. What's helpful is more distally, if you look between the quadratus plantae and the abductor hallucis, in this tissue plane is where we tend to see it. No, where we will see it, actually, I should say. So uh, if you can't see it, where it comes off the lateral plantar nerve, come down to this tissue plane and try to, try to find what something looks like a nerve. So we, we, we can talk about tarsal tunnel syndrome and entrapment neuropathy, where basically there's compression of the nerve or the branches, most commonly a ganglion cyst. You could also have a mass or a tumor varicose veins and other things, but it's usually a ganglion cyst. As I mentioned in the beginning of this talk, that I usually don't see nerve enlargement because this space is so enlarged compared to the other fibrosis canals of the upper extremity. Here we're looking on an MRI with ultrasound as well. This is the flexor retinaculum here, enclosing all the structures in the tarsal tunnel, tibialis posterior, flexor digitorum longus, FHL, flexor hallucis longus, artery veins, this person has three veins, there is the tibial nerve. So there's a lot of space in there. Here is the bifurcation of the medial and lateral branches, and here is the medial calcaneal branch, which stays very superficial and goes straight down to provide sensory to the medial aspect of the heel. So here's an example of tarsal tunnel syndrome from a ganglion cyst. We have a multilocular fluid collection, which is classic for a ganglion cyst. We see these small echoes within it, indicating it's more complex. And here is the tibial nerve being deviated around this ganglion cyst. This person had a ganglion cyst coming from the subtalar joint, and this was causing deviation of the medial plantar branch presenting as tarsal tunnel syndrome. So even though the symptoms may be due to something in the tarsal tunnel, you need to scan the nerve up and down from that point to make sure that the issue isn't proximal or distal to the tarsal tunnel. Here's a patient who presented with uh, tarsal tunnel syndrome, and what we saw here were varices. And this is pretty uncommon, 
but this was asymmetrically the other side. The nerve looked totally normal. Again, the nerve, I don't see enlargement of the nerve, but these uh, number of vessels, this is abnormal and was uh, different from the other side. Okay, the last thing is Martin neuroma. So Martin neuroma is an entrapment of the interdigital nerve, usually the second or third inner space is at the level of the metatarsal heads. Not a tumor like the word neuroma may imply, but it's actually scar tissue and necrosis and granulation tissue relate to entrapment of this nerve. <laughs> and uh, it's prone people who are wearing high heels or a narrow shoe box uh, or narrow toe of their, of their shoe or footwear that can cause this to occur. So ultrasound works pretty well in looking at these Morton aromas. I find that sometimes the diagnosis is difficult, and that is because the tissue normally between the metatarsal heads is somewhat heterogeneous. But we're looking for a hypochoic mass-like area. We hope to see the nerve going into this hypochoic area. It's important that we differentiate this from a bursa. But I have to indicate that when you have a neuroma, the bursa is usually distended. And some people have coined the term bursal neuroma complex because they're really together, and we have to try to sort this out. So for the Morton neuroma technique, which I'll demonstrate, I tend to start first plantar, and what I'll do is push with my finger on the other side to open up the space by spraying the metatarsal heads apart. I'll be sandwiching or compressing the tissue so I can see it better. I start transverse to the metatarsals just to get my bearings, but I'll be looking for a hypoechoic abnormality. What's really important then is I will turn long axis between the metatarsal heads. That's very important. And the last step I'll do, there's three steps, is the molder maneuver, which I'll get to in just a moment. So this is what the normal space looks like. On the MRI, you could see the fibro fatty tissue creating this heterogeneous low echo area. That was, that's what makes it a little challenging because it always, never looks totally clean or homogeneous. This is what a Martin aroma will look like a hypochoic mass-like area. Note here on the MRI this teardrop shape that's going toward the plantar direction. And now some people scan dorsally, but this is why I scan plantar, because this is where the neuroma is going to be located. It's plantar, not dorsal. If you look in long axis, you can often see the edematous nerve going into this mass-like area, plantar being up here, dorsal here. The area that's a little bit more anechoic, that's probably the bursa, that's associated with the more plantar neuroma. Here's another long axis view showing this neuroma. And here we see it um, also scanning from a dorsal approach. And why I'm showing this is note how there's a slightly more hypochoic area that's dorsal. That's going to be the bursa, and this is going to be the neuroma. They're, you know, they're really next to each other. But we know anatomically that the bursa are located more dorsally. If you look at this illustration on the bottom right, here in the plantar aspect, you see the nerve vascular bundles. That's why the neuroma occurs plantar and the bursa is directly between the metatarsal heads. So this normal anatomic relationship helps me decide which one is which. So the, the last step, again, step three, is the Mulder sign, but I also incorporate compression when I'm looking long axis. So again, here is the neuromobursal complex, but when I'm compressing, the more dorsal anechoic area compresses. That's the bursa. The more hypochoic non-compressible area is the neuroma. So it helps me differentiate the two. The other thing by pushing with my hand and with the, my finger in the transducer is I'm eliciting symptoms. The patient will say, yes, you're, re you know, you're hurting me or you're reproducing the symptoms. So that helps with my accuracy as well. So the last bit here is the, the Mulder sign. I go back to the short axis, and I squeeze the foot from side to side, like this. What I'm doing here is I'm purposely making the metatarsal head squeeze together. So here's plantar. This is the neuroma. It's hard to see. This is the normal space. But look what happens when I squeeze the foot from side to side. The neuroma will pop into a more plantar position. Again, why I image from a plantar aspect. So what this does is it makes the neuroma easier to see because it's moving closer to the transducer. It's usually creating a, 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 a click that you can feel through the transducer. It's eliciting symptoms, which helps with the accuracy. And also it helps me say that this is not a bursa. 
although bursa can be enlarged, they don't look hypochoic and, and, and do this appearance uh, during the Mulder sign. So the Mulder's maneuver is, is an important uh, part of my Morton aroma evaluation. So we have uh, until quarter to four. So I'm going to take about five minutes and talk about a few other miscellaneous nerve things. Is that OK? Now, this applies to any nerve. As I mentioned, if you transect a nerve, the nerve end will get enlarged and form an aroma. That's a normal response. So where I tend to use ultrasound is after uh, a knee amputation, because we know that neuromas are going to occur. But what uh, we want to find out is which neuroma is symptomatic. So I'll trace all the nerves, find the neuroma, and for each neuroma, I'll push on it with the transducer. And the patient will say, this is the one that's reproducing my symptoms. That's the problem with MRI, because although we can see these neuromas, we don't know which one is symptomatic. So that's why the real-time assessment is very helpful when trying to decide which neuroma is symptomatic. Here's a patient who had a piece of glass cut their common peroneal nerve. If you look in short axis, this is the sciatic nerve here, and that divides into the tibial nerve and the common peroneal nerve. So is it right where the common peroneal nerve comes off, we see this hypochoic mass I carry, and that's the neuroma. Here I'm looking at a long axis view of the tibial nerve. So as I sweep the transducer laterally, there is the neuroma of the common peroneal nerve. Now, as you can see, there's still nerve continuity. So this was not a complete transection, but a partial transection, creating the fusiform enlargement. And then the last thing, I just want to show you what peripheral nerve sheath tumors look like, because when people present with nerve problems, they're not always from entrapment, and we need to keep this in mind. They fall into two categories, benign and malignant. Benign would include schwannomas and neurofibromas, although we really can't tell the difference between them. In fact, we cannot tell the difference between a benign and malignant nerve sheath tumor. So what I do is I say, I'm just happy I'm saying this is a peripheral nerve sheath tumor, let alone saying benign versus malignant, or what type of benign nerve sheath tumor. So they present as a hypochoic mass. Now, of course, the history wouldn't be a traumatic incision or, or something like that. It'd be just, you know, it would be some nerve symptoms. The hypochoic mass in itself is nonspecific until we see the nerve going in and out of the mass. You can see posterior acoustic enhancement with these because the nerve, the tumor is compact. So the sound beam comes out the back of the nerve sheath tumor uh, without any resistance, and, it, and, it's, and it's bright. So here's an example of a schwannoma. So the first point I want to make is that this looks hypoechoic and almost looks like a cyst. Well, first of all, we think we know this is not a ganglion cyst because remember, ganglion cysts are multilocular. If I see a unilocular, quote, cyst like structure, that is going to be a mucinous tumor or a solid tumor to prove otherwise. This is through transmission, which we see with fluid. This is a solid tumor. How we know? We put on the color Doppler, there's flow within it. Here's another example of this low level echo with through transmission. The nerve is going into it, but note the hyperemia, the neovascularity of this. This was a benign schwannoma, but again, I would just say this is a peripheral nerve sheath tumor, given that it's solid with flow and the nerve going into it. Now, some of these uh, peripheral nerve sheath tumors, when they get large and more chronic, they can become cystic. Now, you look at this thing, you'd say, I don't know what this thing is. I'll get an MR. This is going to need a biopsy because this could be malignant but this is another nerve sheath tumor. Here's a person with a neurofibroma in the deep branch of the radial nerve. You can see this nerve is enlarged, and as it goes, there's proximal, then as it goes distal and divides and goes into the supinator, you can see that this is enlarged. It almost looks like an entrapment neuropathy, but the patient had other neurofibromas, which help with that. A target appearance has been described with these, although nonspecific. And then also with a plexiform neurofibroma, they describe this as a, quote, bag of worms. So I've never seen a bag of worms, but I bet it would look like this, where all these nerves are just, it's just one humongous tangle of nerves. And then here's, here are two examples of malignant 
peripheral nerve sheath tumors to end this talk. Now, the rule of thumb is the larger the mass, the more likely it's going to be malignant. But look how small this one is. And that was malignant. So again, I'm just happy to say there's a mass. It's solid. It's nonspecific. Oh, there's a nerve going into it. OK, probably a peripheral nerve sheath tumor. It need to biopsy it. I don't know if it's benign or malignant. So take home points. The first thing is when looking at nerves, short axis is the way to go. So we have to know the anatomy there. The next thing is when you're thinking about entrapment neuropathies, there are specific locations where entrapment neuropathies occur. It, that's where you should target your search. But don't forget to scan in between those spots very quickly because you could have an unusual thing like a, like a nerve sheet tumor simulating an entrapment neuropathy. Uh, and you can image the limb very quickly and much more quicker than with MR, so it's a pretty efficient exam. And you can target that also based on your clinical judgment. Any questions about uh, this?